we go. I'm just going to welcome everyone to our virtual roundtable on new ideas and programming. Uh, excited to have everyone here today. A couple of quick tech notes. Uh, hopefully a lot of you are familiar with Zoom, um, but if not, uh, most of your controls should be at the bottom of your screen. If you sort of wave your mouse around there, they'll pop up if you can't see them. We do have the live transcript option um, enabled, so you can have subtitles on this program if you would like. Uh, they are auto-generated, so may not be 100% accurate. Um, if you have the subtitles on and you don't want to see them, again, that's one of the controls at the bottom of your screen. Uh, again, we'll turn it over to Amanda and Tucker in a minute, but uh, general Zoom etiquette, if you're not talking or planning to talk, we do ask that you keep yourself muted. Um, and if you would like to speak, um, feel free to either use the raise the hand function um, or put something in the chat you'd like to share. Um, it's, I think right now we have enough folks to see everybody, but we may not see folks. So if you're just kind of waving um, uh, visually and we don't see you, please definitely um, try one of the other options to get to it. Uh, and this is our last of our three roundtables uh, for the winter. Um, we're looking forward to bringing you our next program, which will be in June, which will be a cataloging workshop. Uh, and more details will be available on that in the coming months. Um, and as of course, because you have registered for this, um, you will be getting a link afterwards with the recording. So certainly you can feel free to watch it again or share it with anyone else at your organization. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. Thank you, Eileen. Um, it is a pleasure to virtually be here with you all today for this roundtable. Um, as Eileen said, my name is Amanda Gustin. I'm the public program manager at the Vermont Historical Society, which means I cover public programming and exhibits um, for VHS. Um, so it's my pleasure to, I think my official title for this session is facilitator. Um, Tucker and I are gonna have a, a conversation about a series of topics. And uh, after each topic, we're gonna sort of invite your questions, your ideas, any of your uh, sort of findings from your own organizations. It is a round table. So we're hoping to, to spark some of, that, uh, some of that conversation. So uh, I will turn it over to, to Tucker to introduce himself and then we'll get started on our first topic. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Eileen, for having Roku Museum. Um, so uh, we're very excited to be here today, be a part of this discussion as a guest. And um, I'm the education program manager at Roku Museum. We're located in Ferrisburg, Vermont, um, near Lake Champlain, a little bit south of Burlington, a little bit north of Middlebury. And uh, the history uh, spans about 200 years, four generations of um, the Robinson family. Uh, for the first two generations, they were Quakers. And um, a lot of the, uh, some of the valuable history here is about the Underground Railroad. We're one of the best documented sites on the Underground Railroad. Um, so we tell a lot of different stories that span a lot of different, uh, much time in, in Vermont. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to talk about kind of some new ideas that we've been doing with programming, uh, what we're doing on the education side. Um, and then also we're a small museum, a uh, staff of three. And so I'm the education program manager. I'm also the admin manager as well. Um, so wear different hats, different days. Um, but on the education side, I do the children's programming, teen programming, and then um, adult programming as well, adult education and uh, public programs. Uh, and, and I should also say that Tucker was an intern of mine some years ago. Yeah. Um, he's terrific. Uh, so we are, we're thrilled to have him as a colleague here in Vermont at, at Rokeby. He worked on History Expo with us some years ago. He's been great since then. <laughs> so uh, our first topic uh, is, is to sort of address the elephant in the room, which is that when Tucker and I were sort of bouncing ideas back and forth at this round table, um, we wanted to start with sort of lessons learned from COVID um, and, and how programming had to change very quickly. I and mean, I were just saying this is the two year anniversary of, of the Vermont Historical Society shutting down and going remote uh, today. And uh, so how things evolved during COVID, what, how programming changed and sort of what lessons have we learned and, and how do we expect to, in theory, exit or move forward uh, with, with programming um, post COVID. And I should also clarify that my perspective at VHS is, uh, is generally um, adults and, and public, uh, general public programming. Um, so I personally will not uh, be addressing the VHS education programming. That's my colleagues, uh, Victoria Hughes and Andrew Miles, uh, who work in the K through 12 education programming. So just to clarify what you'll be hearing from me about today. 
Um, so one of the things, you know, two years ago today, um, it was a Monday <laughs> and VHS shut down on a Monday and I had a public program already on a Thursday that was meant to be a, a lecture, part of our third Thursday series uh, about uh, the history of women's suffrage in Vermont. And thankfully for, for a little while, um, up to that point, VHS had, had been live streaming, it has started live streaming its talks about a year and a half previously on Facebook Live. So we had at least some basic infrastructure and some basic understanding of how to use the very rudimentary tools that existed at that time to live stream our programming. So that's what we did um, that day. I see Rachel here. Rachel was there that day. Rachel Onuf was one of our guest speakers that day. Um, uh, who Rachel and Lynn Blackwell presented to an empty room over at the History Center because the museum was closed and we live streamed it to Facebook. And that was our first sort of, okay, let's keep moving forward, but how do we do this thing? Um, and over, over the two years that evolved uh, into sort of other approaches to remote and virtual programming. I know a lot of local historical societies um, have felt like like we have felt that there is a very fairly steep learning curve to virtual and remote programming, but that we've all been on it together and we've all been on it together at light speed. The fact that we're all comfortable using Zoom these days and this is just what we're doing, um, I, I think sometimes we we don't acknowledge what a huge game changer that is uh, and how fast it changed. So over, over the two years, VHS has experimented in a variety of ways to do some interactive programming. We did some virtual cooking classes um, where I, Steve Perkins, our executive director and I stood in his kitchen and had a couple of different cameras for close-ups and things like that and, and taught uh, some cooking and some history alongside that. We did some collections care classes where we brought a whole bunch of collections objects into our room and sort of broadcast and had people share their own stuff up to their screen. Um, we did standard lectures, we did virtual trivia, um, Eileen has been doing these wonderful roundtables. And I think um, one of our biggest lessons learned that we will be proceeding with going forward at the Vermont Historical Society is that we will continue to do remote and virtual programming as part of our standard public programming lineup. But part of our programming process from the beginning, from when we first start to conceptualize a program, will include the question of whether this is a remote program or an in-person question, in-person program. And our goal for in-person programming, which we will be slowly adding back to the schedule, will be, is there something about this program that has to be in-person? Some benefit that is accrued only from being in the same room or in the same physical space with each other. Some answers to that question could be that we are planning a hands-on, a physical hands-on activity as part of the program. Um, you know, potentially it's a, it's a collections workshop and people need to put their hands on things and, and learn how to do things. Maybe we're doing a craft together or learning some kind of technique together um, hands-on. Um, other things could be that we have a program for which we really want to emphasize uh, sort of intimate in-person conversation. Uh, before the pandemic, we did do a series of programs around the release of a new book by Paul Thrills called Read People in Vermont, in which we held conversations around the state about sort of uh, the development of, um, it, it, his, question, his book was about the development of the late 19th and early 20th century sort of Vermont um, infrastructure in a way. So we held these, these in-person um, conversations around the state, something for which we, we really want uh, to be in person. Um, and, and sort of look in each other's eyes and have deep, thoughtful conversations with each other. And I, the third sort of, these are very general buckets, right? But the third sort of general bucket is um, something for which the physical place is an important part of the programming. You know, right now we're all sort of in different places. I heard someone earlier say they're in Myrtle Beach. Um, we've all gotten sort of used to being in very different spaces, but being together in a virtual space. So what our sort of third bucket for an in-person program is, is there something about that physical place? Is there a historical connection? Do we need to be in the museum to do this? Do we need to be in a field uh, to do this? And we can talk a little bit about some of the successes that we've had in various programming aspects of this. But, but one of those three things has to, be, has to be in place for us to be planning it as an in-person program so that we really use the strengths of an in-person program to its advantage and that we plan that in from, from the absolute drawing board, from the very first steps of that program. And the same is true for virtual. So basically everything that doesn't fall into one of those necessary buckets 
will be will be a virtual remote program going forward. Um, roundtables like this are a good um, are a good opportunity for us to all gather from from different parts of the state and different parts of the world, but still have thoughtful conversation. Um, lectures uh, and use the strengths of virtual programming to do that, something like this. Lectures for us, um, we have reoriented what was a traditional in-person lecture series to a, what we're calling a winter speaker series. So we're capitalizing on it being miserable to drive in winter and month season. We're capitalizing, uh, capitalizing on being able to invite speakers that we could never have afforded to bring to Vermont before. Our winter speaker series uh, this year has speakers from all across the United States and Canada. And these are all people that whose work I've admired for a very long time, but absent a large grant or some significant logistical planning, um, we could not have gotten them here to, to Vermont to speak to our audience. And if we had, we could have gotten maybe 100 people in a room. Like we, I would have been thrilled to get 100 people in a room. And now we're averaging three to 400 people signed up for each one of these programs. And usually in the room, 200 and then another 50 or so people I know additionally who are watching that. So there's some drop off. But so that's really capitalizing on the strength of a virtual program, using those opportunities to the best advantage, bringing people together from different places um, and, uh, and doing so. So, so, my, so my takeaway there is, is plan it from the beginning and think of compelling reasons for it to be remote or in person. So that's my, one of my first early lessons learned over the last two years. Um, Tucker, you wanna jump in with anything from Rokby? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree so much with everything that you've said. It we're really doubling down on the planning from the beginning when it's the little seed of an idea. Um, definitely relate to that. Um, if you don't do that, you come up with these issues later on where you say, oh, well, we can't actually do this little part that we planned so much because it's digital or because it's not. Um, and we found the same thing where uh, some things adapted so well for digital and some you just couldn't do digitally and have the same effect. So uh, lectures also, um, and uh, our book group, we have a winter book group that we would meet in person for, and for the last two years we've done online. And both of those uh, drew larger audiences than they did in person. Um, and so those programs just adapted so naturally. The other benefit that you have when you're doing a digital program is that you have kind of media at your fingertips and it, and it flows quite nicely. You don't have to have, um, you know, a, much equipment you can just have your computer itself you can play a video you can record just like eileen's doing and you can come back and and post it to your blog or post it somewhere and folks can, that weren't there can can come and see it um people are so adaptable now with with zoom that people are more used to seeking out those things as well um so of course there's other programs that that don't work in uh digitally or don't work as well so like our family days uh programs like that that use the site um that really uh hammer in uh, some interpretive theme that Rookby has. Um, if we had a like a hands-on program, uh, I've done both of these with, with collections. So there, we have a program called Curator for the Day where um, young teens can come and they learn about what it takes to handle objects and create an exhibit and tell a story with, with objects and kind of get a behind the scenes feel for everything. That wouldn't work the same, but I did do an adult program um, where we brought a uh, retirement community into the archive and we brought out certain objects and I talked about them, talked about stories and, and created basically a, a PowerPoint to kind of go along with the objects that they were seeing. And that actually worked really well. We couldn't have gotten the entire retirement community into our archive. We also couldn't have brought our objects outside of Rokeby. And so it turned out to be a pretty neat program. So it definitely takes a lot of sort of thinking outside the box, but like Amanda said, right from the beginning, um, How's it going to How's it going to work best? Now that being said, if you if you if if we are in another situation next year with with COVID or this upcoming year, um, planning with your in person programming how you can adapt to digital is also important. So, um, for example, we have um, different performances that we've done here. So we had a, a um, event called the Spirits of Rokeby, which we're, we're bringing back again in the fall inspired by um, the spiritualist history here. And um, it was this very fun program. We had never interpreted this part of the history before, but the Robinsons um, later in life got interested in spiritualism, left Quakerism, got interested in spiritualism, and actually had seances inside the house. And we have the transcripts of those seances. 
So we um, brought the uh, performance to light. We had actors um, reading the, the turned into a script, had actors doing a stage reading, and then had an educational component as well as visitors got here. There was a lecture about the history of spiritualism and, um, and how it relates to the Robinson family. And so our backup plan was just a stage reading on Zoom. Um, and we had to kind of plan for both events. It was gonna be a little bit different. It was gonna, the practice for it was gonna be a little bit different. It was gonna be set, set up differently. Um, and as it turned out, we were able to do it in person and it was our first sort of big in-person event that we had, um, but we had to keep the groups down to 10, 10 people. So we had to do these time tickets and a lot of performances and the actors were behind um, plexiglass. Uh, so a lot of adaptations in the last minute, but we knew we needed to always have that backup plan of, okay, what do we do if we can't do this uh, in person? What's that gonna look like? Um, and then uh, in terms of education, in terms of children education, um, we really prioritize seeking out funding to build a virtual tour. And so um, I came on with Rokeby, I've been here almost a year now. So I came on during the pandemic. So um, there, and part of my job is restructuring, rethinking the whole education program, but there wasn't a digital aspect to it at all. And so the fastest thing to get together was to put together a PowerPoint and um, I took some, made some videos, some media sort of aspects of that and, and put it into this PowerPoint and had and tried to kind of recreate the tour that was the in-person tour at Rokeby. Um, but but it felt clunky and it um, and it wasn't very shiny. It wasn't as interesting, you know, for, for a child. And so um, really prioritizing trying to raise funds um, to build this digital program. And so um, we're going to be launching it this spring and we're using a platform that's called Matterport. Um, I'll just put it into the chat here. So that's the, the company that does the technology, but um, essentially it's the same technology that you would see uh, if you were doing like a real estate tour, these 3D real estate tours. Um, and, and it brings you through the historic house, we're doing it on the grounds and then through the historic house, and then you can implant uh, media into that. So you can have a little like a pin as you're walking through this three-dimensional space um, and uh, on say a painting and that'll will pop out um, a little word uh, blurb that talks about the history of the painting or, or, or a video pops out or something like that. And so this will allow us to not only um, reach those audiences in Vermont that can't bus to us because they're just so far away, uh, but also outside of Vermont as well, which is, a, which is a big part of our education goals as well, how to make the Rokeby story nationally. Um, so, so those are uh, some of the things that we that we found, um, and then sort of like some very practical things I wanted to hear, kind of like practical lessons learned. Um, was one of them is the early identification, which we've talked a lot about, and then um, another one is like with digital tickets, and this doesn't necessarily have to do with just um, virtual programming, also programming in person. But um, if the event is ticketed, using a digital ticketing system was something that we decided to do. It costs money, you know, the like um, Eventbrite would be one that you could use or Square, if you use a Square at your site to, for the gift shop or something like that, they have a site called Square Site um, where people can buy tickets online. Um, but essentially um, there's a lot of uh, flakiness, you know, today and th in this day and age people, um, if, they don't, if they don't buy a ticket then day of, the weather is bad or, or this sort of thing and there's not as much of a, um, a reason to do it. But if, you, if you're planning ahead, if you bought a ticket then there's more of sort of a follow through. So that was um, one of the reasons. Of course, there's another side to that as well. Um, you know, a free event or something that you often do want to keep just very uh, easily accessible and um, people can make a last minute decision like this event that also has a valuable place as well. But we kind of decided to make the jump to do digital ticketing rather than having folks call in the museum and, and buy a ticket or, or buy a ticket in person. Um, and it's, it's, it's worked out a lot. Um, it seems to be worth the, the cut that the company makes. Um, another another um, lesson learned is sending the Zoom link uh, last minute. Um, and so being day of or uh, the day before and two things that helps uh, people that are gonna be attending the digital event, it helps to kind of like put it at the top of their inbox so they can easily find it. And then it also helps so that if any, it just decreases the, um, the chance that hackers will come into the into the uh, the meeting, and then um, 
the other part is planning for administration. So that's during the Zoom meeting or during the digital meeting. That's exactly what Eileen did at the beginning, introducing everyone, letting everyone know how it goes. You know, this is a pretty typical thing for those that have been part of a Zoom meeting, but then also having another, per if you are the presenter, having another person that's taking care of kind of the back end of the administration. So they're, uh, answering the chat or, or collecting the questions, they're muting people if they're unmuting themselves, um, that sort of thing. So it's really helpful if you're the presenter to not be playing the role of the admin person as well. Okay, so those are some sort of practical lessons that we learned this year in our, in, uh, our digital programs. I'll, I'll follow up just very briefly on that on a couple of VHS perspectives. Um, what, one of the ways that so for about the first half of the of COVID the pandemic we um, we did the same thing we always had a second person in to to play whack a mole with muting or answer questions in the chat and things like that but we did make the decision to upgrade to the Zoom webinar version uh, for any lectures and things like that that didn't need a conversational setting like the one we're in right now and that has reduced our staff uh, need. Um, Webinar is a slightly different version of Zoom. It costs a little bit more money, um, but it, uh, it it just it default mutes everyone, and it default turns everyone's cameras off. And it also has a moderated system for questions and answers that I find much more easy to keep track of than the chat. So that has reduced our staff need to um, to handle the the lecture style programs. That means it's just me um, in that. Uh, it is it is fairly expensive though. It's not always a solution for people. Um, if anyone wants to upgrade to that, not sure. There are some discount options. Shoot me a after. There's one called TechSoup that is a pain to navigate, but it does save you quite a lot of money. So I can um, help you with that if you're interested in that. Um, and I totally totally agree with Tucker's comment about either making the Zoom public. Um, VHS. I'm going to find some wood to knock on. Has not had problems with Zoom bombing. Um, so that's worked out well for us. Obviously at other organizations, um, town and municipal governments have, um, but we are generally a little bit freer with our Zoom links. Um, but totally, totally agree on that day of, usually what I do is uh, a week before and day of send a reminder with the Zoom link to people. Um, and they've also gotten it when they sign up. So top of inbox that morning just decreases the number of people emailing you and having misplaced it or never having gotten it in the first place because it went to their spam. And it's just one of those digital housekeeping things. It's, it's the like, it's the digital equivalent of that in-person looking out the door at the, right before the program starts to make sure when no one's like running up the sidewalk and looking lost kind of thing um, or, or like topping off the, the food kind of thing. It's just the digital equivalent of that. Um, and also, we, we also went to a ticketed registration system. Um, we use something called JotForm. Um, that has its, again, pluses and minuses. Uh, what that, one of the things that has allowed us to do, uh, and I know you talked, you've talked about development and board stewardship um, through this roundtable, one of the things that has allowed us to do is capture um, attendance information much more efficiently. We have moved to, to an opt out. Um, would you like to sign up for VHS newsletter things? So you have to say, no, do not put me on the email list. It's sort of automatically checked as yes. So we, and, and we also gather attendance information um, on, our, on, our, on our attendees, um, add them to our email list. And that has, uh, has really allowed us to grow our reach by leaps and bounds um, of people who are interested in our programming. Um, and we also, like Tucker, are seeing an out-of-state reach, um, anywhere between 25 and 30 percent of people who sign up for VHS remote programming are outside of the state of Vermont, which is great. So does anyone have, we're meant to be roundtabling it, does anyone have any um, questions about anything that Tucker and I just said, any experiences from your own um, forays into digital programming that you want to share with the group or anything you want to seek advice from for the, from the group? I know we just threw a lot at you, but. I'll just reply about Zoom and, and say our membership is shot up because of using Zoom. We just finished a program with 400 people, most of them residents in, in the community. <clears throat> but we, um, I've experienced both webinars and the regular Zoom over the course of the past two years. And for the small historical society, I vastly prefer the regular Zoom because I want to build community and I want to get to know who the residents are and I want them to get to know each other and see their names and chat with each other. And so 
I've tried to set up the lectures in a way that encourages some verbal chat and definitely the opportunity for people to see each other and say hi to their neighbors and all of that. And that has really increased um, um, the sense of community. I just sent out a survey monkey asking everyone if this if the program had increased sense of community and people are saying yes. Hmm. Yeah, I, there, that is definitely a drawback to the webinar is that it does effectively cut off sort of what we're doing right now, looking at each other's face and just having that conversation. That's a calculation that we made for our, where we really only use it for the lecture style programs where I just could not mute 300 people fast enough. Oh yeah, you know, it's, it's the difference between, you know, a small local historical study and um, I'm really good at mute all of hitting that button, I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> that was not an option early on and I just got, yeah, yeah. So. It, yeah, it's definitely a thing. There was a quick question in the chat too, and then Nancy will, will yours, but the question in the chat was whether we're planning on any hybrid programming. VHS is not. Um, and that's part of what we, we have been thinking a lot about is that the ways in which we are structuring our programming, and, and as we said, we're planning from day one, virtual or in-person. A lot of the ways in which we're structuring and planning of that make hybrid to be the worst of both worlds for the programs that we are designing. Um, it's, it's tricky and difficult to get good quality in both formats for a hybrid presentation. Um, I think that there are other organizations and, um, I know, for example, our city council meetings are always hybrid because that allows for participation from both places, but for the program that we have been doing, we made the decision that that was, that was just not going to be a good, it was not going to honor either, either format with good quality. Tucker, I'd be curious to hear if Ropi is doing that. Yeah, the same same answer essentially. Yeah, it's it's so hard for the presenter um, to try to um, entertain and and engage both audiences at the same time. Um, so we're doing the same thing as sort of trying to pick one or the other. Not to say that 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 there isn't a brilliant opportunity for um, bringing in hybrid programming, but we haven't yeah. done it ourselves. Yeah, there's certainly maybe models out there that that we just haven't explored yet. But but that's our decision for now. Nancy. Yes, I have a question where we're a very small historical society and we want to do a public program. And I wonder if anybody has ideas about how to get the public when, when we're not, uh, you guys um, already have an audience and we don't. We, we would like to get the public to come to a program on cemeteries is the one we want to do. Uh, and we, it would be great to do it by Zoom because more people could do it, but how do you get the word out there? The, these are not people we have on a list. We would like the public to come. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. the general, the people who live in Greensboro in this case. I'd say yeah. your, your um, best friend might be if there's a front porch forum in, in Greensboro. Mm -hmm. um, so with, I think all of our programming, yeah, just about every single program we have will send out, um, we have we have kind of like an army that is our board and volunteers that will post in all the towns that they live in the program that we have on their front porch forum. So it's mm -hmm. not only hitting Ferrisburg the town we're in, but all of the surrounding towns where our community that that is involved with Brokeby um, lives. And so that has worked very well. Um, and. Yeah, so so just to get you know the word out about a, about a, a little program that you're doing, um, and then if you can, if you want to do it digitally, did you say it was at a cemetery? Not at a cemetery, no, but about oh, the cemetery. About sometime. the cemetery. Okay, yeah, yeah. Case. I think that would be a great way. And then the other thing that you can do is is you can you can um, pay for boosting uh, ads on on Facebook and and things like that. And we do that too for some of our events. Um, just to so that it uh, when people are using Facebook and other like social media platforms, it'll uh, it'll the ad for the event will pop up first because you you pay for it. So you can you can do um, ad boosting um, oh. and then uh, yeah, Amanda, anything to add? Yeah, I, I agree with Facebook ad boosting for something like this because for something with a specific interest to the program, like cemeteries, you can mm -hmm. in fact target people who are already interested in cemeteries, and they are out there. Um, Tina in the chat just just recommend looking at Facebook interest groups. Um, a lot of Facebook is migrating a, away from public posting and towards group conversation. Um, and your historical society's Facebook page can sort of be part of those group conversations. Um, that does take people time, right? And it takes a certain, a little bit of Facebook savvy, although the ads are easier, I promise you, the ads are easier to use than you think they are. 
Um, they are, it, you know, you may you may bang up against them a little bit, um, but the ads for basic nonprofit um, or page boosting is is more user friendly than you're probably imagining. Um, any kind of special interest uh, activism or political Facebook ads are extraordinarily difficult, but I, I strongly suspect no one in these in this group is going to fall into that category. So don't don't worry about that too much. Um, building off of, of Dina's suggestion for Facebook interest groups, um, one of the things that I've been trying very hard to do with our and in fact I sent an email in this line just this morning for our lectures has been to do some personal outreach to people who I know will be already interested in the programming that might not be a typical VHS audience. So the example I sent this morning is that we have a, a talk coming up in April um, by the author Sarah Gregg about uh, a New Deal era federal planning program that made an impact in both Western Virginia and in Vermont. And in Vermont, it sort of met with stronger local resistance because there was stronger local organizing around uh, landscape planning. And it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting topic. And so what I did this morning was I have a friend who's a, who's a planner for the state. So I emailed him and I said, hey, this, this bears directly on your work. Um, could you shoot it out to the other planners that you know at, at the state and, and get them um, connected and involved? And, and I will often try and do that. We'll often try and brainstorm interest groups for our virtual programming. It's an easier ask than it used to be. You know, if this had been an in-person program pre-pandemic, I could have emailed my friend and like maybe some of them would have been able to get off lunch and walk over to the museum. But now they can put it on in the background while they're eating lunch or they're working at their desk and they can be part of our audience. Mm -hmm. Last year, we had a program um, by the author Susan Schulten, who's a uh, historian of geography, and she had done this wonderful work on Emma Willard. Um, I, I wish this is something I had thought of, but someone reached out to the alumni of the Emma Willard School in New York, and we got like 150 of them who uh -huh. came to our program about Emma right. Willard because they were super excited uh -huh. about her legacy and her work. Mm -hmm. It was pure serendipity, but that also taught me to like think a little outside the box for places that mm -hmm. um, that cross over with interest um, and, and reach out directly and make the case because attending a virtual program is an easier ask than it used to be of, of, mm -hmm. of coming first. Yeah, and I'll add like the um, cold calls or cold emails. Yeah, it does take time. It takes like a uh, time to, to build that relationship and and uh, and write the email and think about it and do the research of, of uh, who to contact. But it does, uh, we found in particular ways it's it's paid off as well. Um, and then one other thing that I'd add too is um, if your event is free, you can submit it to seven days calendar um, and they'll, they'll post it. And that, you know, is seven days is, you know, sort of Burlington, focus, but it is all of Vermont. And so uh, folks yep. look in there for, for what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then um, you might have seen uh, Rachel added, uh, you can ask the Vermont Cemetery Association and a link to them or the Vermont Old Cemetery Association. Um, those might be good folks to reach out to. And there was also a comment in the chat, if, if, if there's a church as associated with the cemetery in question, they'll also have an outreach list. Yeah, Seven mm -hmm. Days is a Burlington focused audience for in-person stuff, but they did a nice, they get a nice statewide coverage for remote stuff. We've done very well. And occasionally they'll get excited about something and give you editorial coverage as well. Um, and of course I would be remiss if I didn't say I also send it to Eileen because she'll put it in the our, our local history e-news which goes out statewide. We'll do that. Great. There was another Thank question. You so much. You're so welcome, Nancy. There was another question in the chat follow up. Are we going to be live streaming any of our in-person talks or events? Uh, for VHS, we are not. Um, with a few very small exceptions that I'll talk about momentarily, but anything that is a lecture style event is just gonna be what we would call a born digital or a remote only going forward. Um, that's, just, that's just what we're going to do. The small exceptions here um, will be that we have occasionally made some live streaming choices uh, for other programming. Um, we live streamed the History Day Awards ceremony uh, for the past two years, we made quite a production of it. Um, I don't know if that was, it was, we filmed it out of a space, but we were in an empty room. So I don't know that it's a, it's a true live streaming in the sense of we had an audience in the room at the same time, but we did set that up for live streaming. We did a little bit the same thing with our annual meeting um, in that we sort of 
live streamed a series of speakers at a podium, but we also brought in a remote speaker for that. Um, we may make some very specific choices for that going forward in the future, but I would expect and anticipate they will be live streamed versions of uh, a speaker in person, but not necessarily an audience, if that makes sense. It will still be an essentially born digital program. Um, it will just be the way in which we project the content of the program that might be a little bit what you call uh, live streamed. Um, we made those choices because we had a succession of speakers in the room and that was gonna be easier than putting them all on laptops all in each corner of the room. Uh, <laughs> so we set it up and I now have quite a pile of, of various microphones and sound mixers and, and cameras and angles and things like that and multiple monitors that I set up when I do something like that um, through a lot of trial and error. So that's sort of how we've approached the very, very small number of very specific things that we do anything like a live streaming event now. Parker? I don't know if you have anything for um, A nice easy way to live stream is using Facebook also, um, and then it lives on perpetually. So if you have an event like like um, Reading Frederick Douglass is now an annual event that we're doing at Rokeby, and we live stream that, for example, um, and it it's reading uh, his famous speech, Life at Speech, and um, community members are coming up one by one and reading a paragraph or so of it, and then we had a, a, a roundtable discussion afterwards. Um, and something like that worked really well, um, where folks that couldn't come, they can they can um, see it, and then it also kind of shows what you're doing at your uh, site. Um, as folks find your Facebook, uh, they say, "What's this?" and they might just watch a couple minutes of it, but at least they kind of get a sense of the programming that you're offering. So that's a cheap, easy way to do it. Is just set up your. It, we just used our phone. Just set up your phone on a tripod and um, or just in your hand, and uh, just live stream it. Yeah, and that, um, as a heads up on that, it will tell all of your followers that you're live streaming. So it'll kick it right up to the top of their feed. So you'll get some extra eyes and extra attention when you are live streaming on Facebook. So that's one thing to think about. There is a fairly significant lag between what you are streaming and what appears on Facebook. Whenever we have done that, um, that's an area where we do absolutely have a second person monitoring comments and monitoring what's happening on the Facebook page to make sure nothing's going wrong there. Um, we've switched over to live streaming when we do something like that, and that's what we did for, for annual meeting and for um, History Day Awards ceremony, we tend to go to YouTube uh, instead. It'll, it's a little bit less of a lag. We've just, it's the way we preferred to manage linking from the outside to a YouTube link is a little bit, a little bit easier than Facebook. Um, which is not to say you should run out and get a YouTube page if you don't have one. Facebook Live still works just fine. But that's how we have decided um, to move forward. All right. Any other any other questions or comments on this sort of lessons learned bit um, before we continue with other topics? Okay. So the next topic on our list, I think, comes out naturally from this lesson learned um, a little bit, which is the topic of outdoor programming. Um, this is an area that people have generally been more comfortable engaging in, in person, um, over the last two years. Um, and in fact, was one of the first areas that we went back to doing in-person programming in. And we have a couple of sort of lessons learned from outdoor programming, but if, you're, if your organization or historical society has not yet experimented with, with some kind of outdoor programming, then I would, I would strongly recommend thinking about it and looking into it. Um, it offers a couple of really, really great advantages. Um, one is that it can draw that different audience. Um, people are a little more excited about maybe walking around a space, doing some hiking, being in a physical outdoor space than maybe they are sitting in a function room in a historical society. It's just a different, different brain mindset kind of thing. So it can present a, a different audience. Uh, one is that it's, it's easier for people who are nervous about COVID right now to attend an outdoor program. Um, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but my understanding is that scientifically it could be considered a little safer for people who are still being extremely cautious. Um, and that's the tack we have, we have taken as well. Um, and for us as a state historical society, one of our big sort of tensions in our programming is doing an in-person programming in one specific place while being, still being the historical society of the entire state of Vermont. 
that's not as much a, attention a lot of you have being uh, a little bit more place-based organizations, but it is for us. And one of the things that outdoor programming has allowed us is doing some place-based programming in different parts of the state. Um, so last summer, we did a couple of, um, of hikes with, uh, in partnership with local historical societies on the trails of the hunts of the last few catamounts in the state of Vermont. We went to fields or into the woods and traced the paths of, of these hunts um, and told the stories of them, told the background and the history of the catamount. This ties in with our exhibit right now on the catamount in Vermont. Um, Ellen, Ellen Clatterberg from the um, Weathersfield Historical Society just left, but we had a terrific, terrific event with Weathersfield. Um, and we also had a um, terrific event with Barnard as well. And they both did a, just a spectacular job of planning those events. Um, and, and they were extremely well attended with tons of people that, that were not previously connected to the, either the historical society, the Vermont Historical Society or the local historical society. Um, so I would strongly recommend uh, reaching out to either of those two historical societies. I think they did just an absolutely bang up job on them. And that's some of, we are looking to do the same thing this summer. Our next uh, upcoming ex exhibition is gonna be on James Wilson and his globes and more generally the idea of globes and maps in Vermont history. So uh, we are working on a partnership with the Vermont Society of Land Surveyors to do place-based geography programming around the state of Vermont. They're gonna bring surveying tools and teach how surveying would have been done uh, over centuries of surveying. Super excited for it. We're hopefully going to go to some of the gores in Vermont and talk about like what is a gore, why is a gore, how is a gore, um, and the surveying challenges of that. Um, and uh, and so that's an that's an opportunity for us to get out, go to the field, do some hands-on stuff. Again, that that imperative that we talked about earlier of in-person programming having. Uh, that hits two of our buckets for us, right? It gets an in, in a hands-on component and gets a place-based history um, component for us. Uh, and it gets us out and about to different parts of the state that's not just um, our physical spaces in Marion and Montpelier. So I know that Tucker and Ropey have also been doing some really cool outdoor programming. That's really interesting to hear about, Amanda, especially you know, thinking about, okay, if you don't have the outdoor space, okay, well, uh, VHS can bring our expertise at two partnerships with others that have these spaces and what can we do outside of VHS? That's interesting. The the pandemic had to, we had to do so much improvising, so many institutions, you know, okay, let's just think on our feet, but it creates all this creativity. So it's interesting to hear about. Um, so, you know, a kind of similar vein, we, now here we do have the outdoor space. So there's 90 acres here and um, the historic house and then surrounding the historic house are farm buildings, seven farm buildings, and then like the agricultural historic grounds. And so um, one thing that was being done before the pandemic, but we've continued doing is having that 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 space always open to the public um, without charging a fee. So that makes it more accessible to everyone. So anyone can come to Rokeby, they can bring their dog, they can walk out on the trail. So there's 90 acres worth of trails that are maintained by volunteer work. So we always um, carefully use the word wild as we uh, talk about them with visitors um, as they're heading out there. But um, but those are always open to anyone. And so it helps do a couple different things. One, it makes it financially accessible. Part of Rokeby is financially success, accessible to anyone at any time if they can get here. Um, you pay, when you pay admission, you, you get admission into the exhibits and, uh, and the tour of the historic house, um, but the rest is all open. And so there's all those seven farm buildings that I talked about, those are all open. They have signage in them as well that you, people can wander around. Also, it helps build um, the relationship with our direct neighbors, like our direct local community um, thinks about Rokeby as a place to come to. They start building a relationship with it. They start thinking about it as kind of a center to their community and start to care about it because they're familiar with the grounds and they've you know, made memories there. So that's one of the goals coming out of that as well. Um, and then in terms of what we did for, um, for outdoor programming because of the pandemic, it really is it like boils down to, um, it was improvising as to what are the skills that we have as individual staff here and, um, and as, as friends of the museum, you know, volunteers or, or, or partners that have certain expertises and, and can engage with a group like a, like a guide, for example, that gives tours and is used to engaging audiences, um, but also has this other skill, like their, uh, their profession was being a birder or something like that. And so, that was the first like gut reaction was starting to um, just build these programs. So I, I have a background in theater. So um, I held some theater programs. I'm, I'm doing a theater camp this summer where we're um, 
building a play, uh, the kids are building a play based on or, or inspired by the history and the grounds and that sort of thing, and then putting it on at the end. Um, and so, you know, what do we already know how to do? I, I had a um, meditation program at the museum um, that uh, for this, the same reason, I, you know, I've done guided meditation before. And so something that I could kind of pull out of my, my um, back pocket. And uh, this, this volunteer is gonna be uh, leading, he did it last year, he's gonna do it this year, uh, a birder walk um, in May uh, for early in the morning, you know, to, to see the migrating birds. Um, so, some of this also grew from partnerships similar to what Amanda was saying. Um, one of the partnerships that we've started to build with education is the libraries, local libraries uh, near us. And through that, um, the Bixby Library is going to be getting a series of telescopes. And so um, from that partnership through this idea, we have this gigantic field behind Rokeby. So we're going to do some stargazing. Um, probably this program is going to be in May as well as coming together quickly. Um, and so, you know, what, how can we use the site uh, at night? How can we use the site at a different time? And they have these, these wonderful telescopes that they uh, want to have a reason to use. Um, and so if you live near Bixby, um, they're folks can just check them out, which is a really cool program. But so using the, the partnerships that are already in place, trying to build other partnerships and just thinking, okay, what do we have? We have the resource is the site itself. Well, how can we use it in ways that we haven't used it before? And then all of our regular programs were, um, for the most part, were uh, done uh, outside. So our, our family events, we were really growing this like performance side of things. So theater and music, uh, music at the museum is another event that we do. And all of those things can take place outside, but you have to have a backup rain plan as well. And we're lucky enough to kind of have a, a barn type building where you can open either side, either door. And so there's a breezeway in between. And so if there's some sort of, you know, barn like space that you can um, clean up and, and use uh, for a backup plan and a rain plan, you always kind of have to have one of those as well, or um, raising funds to purchase some tents or something like that. Um, but certainly we, have thought a lot about how we can, I, that's like the first thing is how we, can we do this outside um, so that we can have this program in person. Um, yeah, and then, uh, and then another sort of interesting thing is that I talked about those farm buildings and this has a little bit more to do with like with ADA accessibility, but um, we're restructuring our agricultural story. And so we're gonna redo all of the signage of all of the farm buildings. Right now, all that signage is inside the farm buildings, but all of those farm buildings aren't, they're old farm buildings. They, they can't get, uh, they're not accessible for ADA at this point. And so we have some funding to make some of them accessible, which we're prioritizing, but the ones that we can't afford making accessible right now, we're pulling the signage on the outside of the building. And so folks can walk up to the outside at any time and they can read the sign about, you know, what was this farm building used for. So thinking about um, accessibility, not just with finances, um, but also um, physical accessibility. Uh, another thing that we did was a story walk um, on our trails. And so um, we chose different children's books that um, had to do with the, the interpretive themes of Rokeby, which are art, agriculture, and abolition. Um, and so you take a book, you might have seen story walks before, you take a book and you, it, feels, it feels kind of sacrilegious. You uh, cut out the pages, um, laminate them, and then you can put them on posts. We actually hung them with wire um, on uh, the different trees and the shrubs. And then um, a family can walk through and, and read a children's book as they take a little hike. Um, and so it's kind of using the, the trail system in a, in a different way. Yeah, I'll stop myself there, but yeah. I, one of the things you said that really stuck out to me, Tucker, is, is I, I don't know if anyone else has had this experience, but I place a primacy on um, historic places that I can hike with my dog right now. <laughs> like that's a, that's a key like visitation thing uh, that my husband and I do like go somewhere but where we can hike with the dog but also like learn history and things like that and I know that that I have heard anecdotally quite a lot of other people are looking for like short hikes where they can also have some sort of cultural experience or, or learn things or interesting things hmm. so I think providing those opportunities um, can be huge right now I, I love that story walk I also agree it makes me a little squeamish to cut books up but in service of a good cause and I love that idea that they can read a book by walking through um through nature and and so on and, and learn things um by walking out and about I think we often get very attached to our build we for obvious reasons like we work so hard on interpreting them and understanding them and, and 
preserving them. We get very attached to our buildings, um, but there are so many more places that we can explore and tell the history of um, or bring history to, uh, even if it's if it's just a, a nature hike, uh, everywhere it's got its history, or you can always tell a story while you're hiking or something like that. But but that outdoor um, component can can just be such a boon uh, to, to your audience. Yeah, Does anyone Oh, Sorry. Just, one more point in there is thinking, also thinking about when you're thinking about how we can make the site more accessible to other kinds of folks. Also, like what you said, Amanda, just made me think about this, um, folks that aren't interested in history. So someone just wants to come somewhere to, to be in nature and, and walk their dog, and they're not thinking about Rokeby as a place that they would come to, um, because Rokeby is a history site, and I don't like history, so I don't really want to go to a historic site. Um, but Rokeby can also just be a place where you come um, to spend some time outside. And so, um, and that will also build that same relationship. So how can we think about accessing those audiences that really don't care about history or <laughs> that we haven't convinced yet to care about history? Yeah, there we go. I like that last one because anyone who's coming to Rokeby and hiking trails is inevitably gonna start to read the stuff that's around them and start to absorb it and start to build that positive association um, with Rokeby, even if they were just coming for the, for the gorgeous trails, um, they're also soaking up a bit of that cultural landscape and, and learning and, and making those connections for sure. Does anyone have any any questions or comments or thoughts? Um, any anyone been doing any outdoor programming with your organization um, or, or questions about how we've been handling it? Okay, that's fun. Well, I would encourage you to to think about it. Um, oh. oh. Yeah, Sarah, Sarah, so Sarah Rooker in the chat has left one of my favorite sort of clever um, outdoor, I guess, ish programs. Do you want to talk about it, Sarah? I would love to. Uh, sure. We did this last uh, spring and we're going to repeat, repeat it this fall. We picked, um, so we designed a tour to replace our house and garden tour as a fundraiser. And the uh, tour included the four farm stands in Norwich, as well as three or four, I can't remember, historic farms in the town. And we made basically just foam core exhibits of old photos of the farms, you know, with labels. So you could drive from farm to farm and read the history of the farm and also stop and pick up food at the farm stands. Um, we offered it to bicyclists too, and we had a lot of young people. Well, actually, we had a lot of people in general. I mean, we had a lot of people with e-bikes in particular. And in the end, we ended up partnering with a local e-bike rental place so people could rent an e-bike. And they did the whole, you know, they biked the whole thing even way up into the hills. Um, it was a good fundraiser, and we ended up with younger people and joining the uh, museum. So it was fun and we're, we're going to repeat the exact same thing Columbus Day weekend because well foliage apple cider yeah more interesting food than there was in June and I think we'll get an even bigger crowd even if it's a complete repeat yeah that's brilliant you got food you have history and you have biking <laughs> it's checking a lot of boxes for people's interests we did a little podcast too so you could stop and listen to to a st some stories so there was a lot to it. And I wanted to repeat it because it was so much work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, I love the, the way that brings so many things together though. Nancy? Oh, you're muted, Nancy. Yeah, in, in Greensboro, we have two villages and we have um, history explorer walks. And in front of the, our historical sites or maybe not buildings that we know are historical we we have set up um for for two summers now uh just in front of the building we have a picture of the way it used to be with a short history of it and that seems people can do it on their own we did it because of covid and it, it's been very successful Another thing that we did on our trails is um, we have an interpretive map uh, that was made and then there's um, posts with numbers throughout one of the trails and the map tells stories about the history of the farm. Um, and that can be adapted in all sorts of different ways and we we sell it um, for $2 uh, that you can just come to Rokeby. you don't have to go to the, the um, exhibits if you don't want, 
you can um, walk out on the trails and just kind of walk them uh, for free, but then also you could have this kind of enhanced experience by um, having this the interpretive history, the history of the site as you go through. But it's pretty easy. You know, it takes a long time to put together, to do the research, to do the history, to put it into um, a nice format um, and then print it. But then once you have it, we've had it for years and years, and um, and it's a, just a whole new way to sort of engage folks. So um, you can also do something as simply as that if you don't if you don't have the funding or you don't want to put the funding towards like building signs, um, putting it on paper, but having these posts or these numbers throughout that people can find as they go. And of course, there's digital versions of that with mobile apps as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm a big advocate though of just doing it the old fashioned um, low tech way. Um, it's easy to change out, it's easy to swap out and you're not requiring people to learn another set of, of tools or download another another app. Um, so I like the idea of just, just putting stuff out in front of spaces that you need people to. I think every historical society should own a laminator. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're surprisingly affordable. Uh, laminators oh, but, and crickets are both I, alike. I can see Rachel cringing, but not to laminate historic documents. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I don't. Yeah, for your other stuff, for your reproduction. You can and be kind laminate. to it and use it slowly because it, it'll start getting mad at you, especially if you buy the cheap kind. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting like a sense memory of the smell. Uh, <laughs> Um, so we are just about at time, Eileen? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, I guess we'll, we'll, before we do a quick wrap up, are there any other questions or comments about anything else that we have shared? Okay. Tucker, I'll make you go first um, with, a, with any one or two like final lessons that you want people to, to go take away today. Sure, sure. Um, I think being creative is a, is a big one. Um, thinking outside, using this, this uh, opportunity to think outside the box can bring all sorts of interesting things out and bring all sorts of new ideas. Um, partnering is, is huge. Thinking about how um, other institutions, who you can you know, bring both institutions up uh, by, by partnering together, using the, the skills and the expertise that certain people have and um, seeing if they're interested in, in doing something with your program. It takes so much time, the networking, the, the emailing, the talking, the um, going down rabbit holes that lead to nowhere will definitely take time, but um, it is really worth it in the long run. And then, and then you know more folks that are more associated with the museum or historic site. Great, thank you. Uh, I think one of my takeaways from sort of this conversation with Tucker and listening to some of you is, you know, we talked a lot about building programs from the start um, and keeping in mind your audience and your goals for the program and about whether it's remote or in person and ways to do that. But one of my takeaways too, is to um, interpret your mission and your work generously. Uh, and by that, I mean, don't just do programming on anything and everything, but you heard Tucker lift off a lot of, uh, a lot of really great ideas that, that do come out of the mission of Brookby and do come out of the, the Robinson family and the ideas of the Robinson family, but are not necessarily what you might call a typical program for an historic site um, or museum, but have been extremely successful and are thoughtful. Uh, I was struck a little bit by that um, with, with what Sarah was talking about too, with that extremely successful tour where they sent people around like, oh, why are we just going to local restaurants? What does that have to do with our local society? It's, it's about community and it's about building experiences for people and making connections um, with history, even if it isn't like they must come away from this, having learned that this mill was built in this year. Um, if you're getting them to think more broadly um, and more generously about the history of their area and make connections with the community, um, that will lend itself, I think, to that creative out of the box uh, thinking and, and will spur some, some different ways to, um, different ways to come at programming and different ways to engage with different so that's going to be my takeaway. Um, Eileen, any any takeaways from you, or you want to send us out? Uh, no, I think that's again what I what I love about again having to sort of rethink and redo some some stuff. And I know it's been difficult for a lot of smaller organizations, especially. But is that idea of thinking about yourselves as community organizations and what that means in a broader sense? And and sometimes you're just you, you can be a, an asset in ways that you didn't think possible. And then you can, you can hopefully then gather them around and get them into your programming, get them into your, your community, get them on the board, get them helping volunteering. Um, 
And so all these little bits and pieces can really add up, I think, as you as you go along. Um, and I think, again, you know, one thing we didn't talk about, but I think to me, one of the takeaways we have a little bit is is calendaring up the ways in which we approach things. So depending on your site, you know, outdoor programming might be different in the winter than in the spring or summer. You might have cross country ski or snowshoe trails available, or you might be only like people can only walk the grounds in the summer or we have great gardens. You know, for us, again, doing a lot of virtual programming over the winter, as Amanda noted, um, because nobody wants to drive when it's snowing or half the state is in Florida or Myrtle Beach or wherever they're at. Um, and so I think, again, thinking about those aspects of what, what makes good programming at the right time in the right place are, are things for you as an organization to figure out yourselves. Yep, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, lots of great things. Again, hopefully come to VHS programs. Definitely visit Rokeby if you haven't been there. Uh, certainly if you haven't been there in a couple of years, um, doing some really great stuff. So we encourage everyone to get out and about now that it's nice and sunny and 60 degrees out at least for a couple of days. So thanks again. If you registered, you'll get this uh, the link to the recording directly. Uh, again, happy to have you share it. Thank you all again and have a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you so